But I do want to introduce you to our panelists for this evening's presentation. First and foremost, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator tonight. Next slide, please. This is Colonel Nick Johnson, retired. Colonel Nick Johnson is a Chicago native who served as an infantry officer with the Illinois Army National Guard for 32 years before retiring in June 2022. He commanded at every level from company to brigade and supported military operations in Panama, Poland, Germany, the Republic of Korea, Afghanistan, Jordan, and Ukraine. As a citizen soldier, he has nearly 30 years of experience in community mental health and is currently employed as a clinical psychologist with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs at the Great Lakes Naval Station Recruit Evaluation Unit. Quick round of applause for our moderator tonight, Nick Johnson. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to introduce to you to Lieutenant Colonel James Lechner. He will be presenting this evening via Zoom. Lieutenant Colonel James Lechner retired from the United States Army after 27 years of service. He served in a variety of command and staff positions within conventional and special operations units and participated in eight operational deployments in Sinai, Bosnia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia. In addition to his many deployments, Jim has served and is, as an advisor to the National Security Council, as well as numerous tours advising the Central Intelligence Agency. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, Jim has served as a war correspondent with Newsmax and the Washington Times and a number of other media outlets. Please join us in welcoming James Lechner. James is joining us this evening from the Ukraine. He will not be taking questions about Ukraine this evening, um, but we are hoping that he'll be able to join us a little later. It is 4 a.m., in all fairness. Uh, Command Sergeant Major Sean Watson, who is also presenting via Zoom this evening. Command Sergeant Major Sean Watson enlisted in the United States Army as an infantryman on July 12, 1983, and has served in every capacity from rifleman to Command Sergeant Major, retiring in June 2015. He served nine years with the 75th Ranger Regiment in various leadership positions as and as an instructor for the Regimental Selection Course. He served with the regiment. His service with the regiment also includes two combat tours, first with Operation Just Cause in Panama in 1989, and then as part of Operation Gothic Serpent in Mogadishu, Somalia in 1993. Please join me in welcoming virtually Command Sergeant Major Sean Watson. Also presenting to us from Zoom is Riley Cash. Riley Cash joined the United States Army in 1990 and went through basic and advanced training and airborne school before attending and passing the selection course to join the Rangers. He was assigned to 3rd Platoon, Company B, 3rd Battalion of the 75th Ranger Regiment as a fire support specialist. During the October 3rd, 1993 mission, Riley called for air support from the helicopters while simultaneously functioning as the vehicle's um, NCOIC, and was one of only two members of the fire support team who was not wounded during the battle. Riley went on to use his knowledge of urban fighting to train rangers in close proximity combat and fire support, and then worked in joint close air support selection in the office of the Secretary of Defense to rewrite close air support doctrine across all services. Join me in welcoming Riley Cash. And last, but certainly not least, um, a great friend to the museum and joining us in person tonight is Mike Goodale. Mike Goodale enlisted in the United States Army in 1990 as an artilleryman. After his initial training and selection, he was assigned as a forward observer to Company B, 3rd Battalion of the 75th Ranger Regiment. In August 1993, Sergeant Goodale was deployed to Somalia as a part of Task Force Ranger. For his service during that operation, he was awarded the Bronze Star Medal with Valor Device and Purple Heart. 
After completing his service on active duty, he returned home to Illinois to earn his bachelor's degree in history and master's degree in military history while continuing to serve as a member of the Illinois Army National Guard with Company C, 1st Battalion, 178th Infantry Regiment, this time, this time as an infantryman. He began his career in and out of the classroom as a high school history teacher and as a public programs manager here at Cantini Park. Everybody join me in welcoming Mike Goodale. At this time, I'm going to pass this over to our moderator, and he's going to give us a nice overview of the battle as we head into the Q&A. Do I need this? Oh, no, you already have my microphone. Sorry. All right. Um, can you hear me? All right. What? <laughs> all right. Hey, good evening. Um, thank you all for coming, um, whether in person or via Zoom in terms of a nice presentation. All right. I want to thank Contigny for putting this on um, and also want to thank Mike and his band of brothers for being able to be here um, to do this with us tonight. And also we need to make um, note of the 18 um, Americans who lost their lives in the battle on October 3rd and the 4th and the 43, I believe it was, as total for the whole deployment in terms of supporting operations in Somalia, all right? So I'm gonna set the stage, as she mentioned tonight, and I'm gonna mention to you about my references I had, just so everyone understand that. So one reference I'm gonna have, which is actually about 90% of what I'm gonna talk about comes right out of the United States Army's, um, the United States Forces Somalia's After Action Report, which was written by Dr. Richard Stewart. So it's not going to be Nick Johnson's editorializing or, or view about things. It's going to be straight from what the military says is what occurred. And also I'm going to reference Black Hawk Down, A Story of Modern Warfare by uh, Mark Bowden. All right. So let me start. All right. The United States' interest in the African continent goes back to its founding, which um, recent interest in the Horn of Africa goes back to the Cold War. The United States' presence was in the northern part of Ethiopia, where it backed Emperor Haile Selassie, and established a listening post, while the Soviet Union's presence was in Somalia, where it supported the regime of Mohammed Syed Biri. Syed Biri ruled with terror for 20 years until he was overthrown and fled the country in January 1991. As sectarian and ethnic warfare raged across Somalia, regional warlords began to rise and assert themselves. Coupled with this, record drought led thousands to die and many more to become internally displaced. Hunger became a weapon of the warlords. The two main feuding warlords were General Muhammad Farah Adid of the Hubbard Gitter subclan and Ali Mahdi Muhammad of the Abgal subclan, with Adid being the strongest. Adid formally served as the Army Chief of Staff and former ambassador to India under Syed Bair. He now ran the Somali National Alliance. UN Secretary General Boutus Boutus Ghali and General Adid knew one another back to Boutus Ghali's days as an Egyptian diplomat. Mark Bowden in his book where he referenced um, someone from the region who said that, um, that Boutus Ghali was a longtime enemy of the Hubbard Gitter clan and Adid because he worked against Adid's revolutionary forces at the time when Biri was overthrown. It was believed that Boutus Ghali wanted to restore the Darud clan, Biri's clan. The United Nations reacted to the worsening plights in Somalia on April 24, 1992, with Resolution 751 authorizing humanitarian relief efforts and creating United Nations Somalia. From the beginning, significant amounts of supplies were being hijacked by the armies of the clans or corrupt international relief organization workers. In an effort to assist with American relief efforts, U.S. President George H.W. Bush launched Operation Provide Relief on August 15, 1992. As a security measure, Soldiers of the 5th Special Forces Group out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, were sent with those forces. Operation Restore Hope followed on December 8th under the United Task Force. The 1st Marine Expeditionary Force from Camp Pendleton formed the bulk of this headquarters with augmentation from the other services and allied nations. Lieutenant General Robert Johnson commanded this task force under U.S., not U.N. direction. Warlords then agreed to work together and work with the U.S. on the distribution of the relief supplies. Resolution 814 passed on March 26, 1993, giving the United Nations broad authority to intervene into another country's affairs. And the United Nations Somalia became United Nations Somalia II, under the command of Turkish Lieutenant General Sevek Beer, 
with U.S. Army Major General Thomas Montgomery as his deputy. Retired Admiral Jonathan Howe from the U.S. was tasked with leading the U.N. mission in Somalia. Adid had little respect for this new organization or its leaders, especially Admiral Howe. Adid's Somalia National Alliance ambushed Pakistani soldiers on June 5, 1993, killing 24 and wounding 44. The UN passed Security Council Resolution 837 the next day that adopted a more aggressive military stance against Adid and asked for additional troops and equipment and directed the apprehension of Adid and those responsible for the deaths of the Pakistani soldiers. That resolution was the one that authorized military operations in Somalia at the time. Before, it was just provide relief support. You can do things to protect your, your own forces for your own um, protection, but in terms of military, military operations of um, Resolution 837. Skirmishes with Adid's sub-plan continued. On July 12, 1993, the American QRF attacked one of Adid's compounds with its helicopter gunships. Coincidentally, the leadership of the elders of the Herbert Gitter clan was meeting at that time to discuss how to respond to the latest peace plan or initiative developed by Admiral Howe. For some unknown reason, Adid was not there. It wasn't there, they attacked it, killed all the leaders there and the elders, and that left Adid being a lone leader of the, um, the clan. There would be no peace from that day on. On August 8th, Adid's forces de detonated a mine under a passing United States military police vehicle, killing four UN Secretary General, Boutrous Ghali asked the new U.S. administration to assist in capturing Adid. Secretary of Defense Les Aspen directed the deployment of a Joint Special Operations Task Force to Somalia on August 22, 1993. Next slide, please. Task Force Ranger, under the command of Major General William Garrison, was tasked with capturing Adid and his key lieutenants and turning them over to U.N. forces. Task Force Ranger arrives in Somalia on August 29, 1993. Now, some other things we just put out in terms of looking at this from 100,000 feet, all right? So this is August 29th, 1993, but if you look at it before that, you had the U.S. elections in November. So right before that was when um, you started putting more relief um, soldiers here in terms of the, when the um, um, Special Forces guys from Fort Campbell got there, all right? And then um, you have for the United States, you have the election, change in leadership for the presidency, and then within six months of the new administration coming in power, February 26, 1993, one month after the inauguration, an explosion at the World Trade Center in New York led to six people being killed and thousands being injured. That was the first attack at World Trade Center. Two days later after that, February 28, 1993, was when the ATF attempted a raid at the Branch Davidian site in Waco, Texas, where um, to execute a search warrant against a religious cult led by uh, this Messiah-style uh, David Koresh. The ensuing battle um, um, killed five ATF agents and five Branch Davidians, injuring 16 more agents. Standoff for 51 days ensued. Then after 51 days, the, the um, ATF and other officers went in to, to end the standoff. A fire broke out and 76 of the 85 Branch Davidians, including Koresh, um, and several children were killed. So that's some of the context of what was going on in terms of 100,000 feet that has an implication, I believe, in terms of looking at the administration, in terms of how they put together this mission. All right, I will pass it now on to Mike, if you can. So my task for tonight is to uh, <laughs> talk about a 17-hour firefight uh, in the span of about 15, maybe 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> so bear with me, if you will, please. Um, but one thing I, I do have to say is that, um, you know, it, there's too many stories to tell about what happened on, you know, on the ground uh, in Somalia. Um, the, the acts of valor and, and the heroism that was displayed at all levels is absolutely astounding, uh, from, from officers down to privates doing things that, you know, people just wouldn't think to do <laughs> in order to get the job done. And that's part of the reason that uh, as many of us came out, uh, you know, alive as it was. And I should include also, it's not just the members of Task Force Ranger. It was also, uh, you know, the, the soldiers in uh, 10th, Mountain. 10th Mountain, 
the, the second of the 14th Infantry of 10th Mountain Division, the Malaysians, the Pakistanis that actually came out uh, as well to help get the convoy through, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, if we could start going through some of these. Uh, so a, a quick overview of the mission, right? You're all pretty familiar with where the country is over on the east side of Africa. But uh, in the next couple of slides, I just wanted to show a little bit about the, um, uh, you know, the countryside from the air. Actually, the, the coastline was actually beautiful. Uh, we flew over it a whole bunch. Uh, but the, the idea that you need to keep in mind is that we were not necessarily under the jurisdiction of UN command. We were solely under Special Operations Command reporting to the president. Um, this slide, it's a company photo. It was just our company there. Uh, that doesn't include the Delta uh, squadron that was, that was part of the mission as well, or the helicopter pilots. And we needed to add in a couple of more vehicles, and that would give you an idea of the actual numbers of people we had on, on the ground then. Um, this was just life in, you know, in the hangar, and I include both of these pictures for a specific reason. The one, uh, the guy up on top scratching his head, it was really kind of universal for all of us getting there, kind of going, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> um, but we were just getting settled, you know. Uh, and then further down, um, <laughs> that was life after we had gotten settled, and uh, one of my esteemed panelists is actually in that photo, um, Sergeant Major Watson. And uh, if you take a look at the guy, he's, he's actually staring out uh, from the picture, in typical fashion, he was about to school some young ranger uh, because we were playing uh, Risk, the board game, and I'm sure whoever was playing against him was thinking, I got this guy, and you know, he's a platoon sergeant, and I'm gonna wipe him out. And in typical fashion, uh, Sean Watson was going to school this young ranger very quickly uh, in the uh, error of his ways. Um, but we did a lot of that because we were bored. Um, it, so in order to get rid of that boredom, we'd also uh, keep training and keep our skills sharp, getting ready for missions. So uh, that being said, let's move on. I should also mention before October 3rd, we did six other missions, six other raids into the city um, in which we captured uh, Adid's finance minister and also uh, we only sustained two uh, injuries. In, in those six raids. So we had a pretty good record. And we, we were really starting to fall into knowing what we were doing exactly when we hit the ground and, and how that all would work. So uh, let's get to October 3rd then. We'll keep going, yep. Um, <laughs> it was a Sunday afternoon. Uh, it, it was a typical Sunday afternoon. We were all doing uh, either working on our tans or playing volleyball uh, or reading books, kind of entertaining ourselves. Sunday, you know, daytime operations are not what uh, rangers are all about. They usually typically operate at night. So, you know, during the day, we're just trying to, you know, relax a little bit. Uh, but there was a lot of um, activity going on, people running back and forth from the command center to another building. And, and so a lot of us that were watching, seeing people running back and forth, were like, eh, okay, something's about to happen. Let's go start getting, uh, get kitted up and, and wait for the mission call to come. So um, the whole mission was that a deed, and not only two of his lieutenants, but 17 total were meeting together at one spot. And uh, they were gonna do that in the middle of the day and it was a target that we could not pass up, even though it was a daytime uh, uh, meeting that was happening. The members of the task force were really all about, let's just get this job done. So uh, we decided, let's do this. It'll take about 45 minutes. We'll be back before dinner. Um, we were a little bit off on that one. Um, for the mission itself, we got our standard mission brief, and, and by this time, it was somebody coming in from the command center with uh, an aerial photograph uh, that was a photocopy, and it was usually pretty grainy, and they would walk in and go, okay, here's the target building. Um, chalk one's going to go here, chalk two there, and every ranger knew what their job was at, the, at that time. So we said, yeah, that's fine. We got this, right? 
Um, if you look it, in this particular uh, graphic, okay, the target building is where Delta Force was actually going to go in, go through the building, and arrest anybody inside. The Ranger uh, mission for all of this was to cordon off the area, not let anyone in or out, uh, and then basically wait for our way out. Now, this particular mission, our way out, was going to be a convoy of trucks and vehicles that were going to drive up because there was nowhere for the aircraft to actually land uh, that we, that we uh, infilled on. So, um, 3.30, we launched. We flew outside of the city a bit. Um, the, the template that we started to do was uh, fly somewhere outside of visual range and, and hearing range of the Somalis in the city, and then at the appointed time, fly in from the north or the west uh, as quickly as possible to hit the target uh, to surprise them. Well, uh, we didn't necessarily surprise them as much as we wanted um, because it was a bad part of town. It was the Bakara Market, which um, is a really, really uh, dangerous part of the city. Lots of bad guys there, at least from our perspective. Um, so, uh, myself and uh, Colonel Lechner uh, were in Chalk 1 with Captain Steele up there. Um, Sergeant, Sergeant Major Watson, he was in Chalk 2, he was in charge of, uh, I'm sorry, Chalk 3, he was in charge of Chalk 3. Uh, and then Raleigh Cash on the panel, he was down in the convoy, kind of waiting around, right? Um, so. Once we hit the ground, we started doing what we always did, which is execute the mission. Rangers were securing the, uh, the outside perimeter. Delta was going through the building, securing prisoners. And in a half hour, we had it done. It was complete. We had all of our prisoners in flex cuffs. We called the convoy to come get us. And they pulled up right on time like they were supposed to. And we started to um, load them up. That's when uh, you know the, the first helicopter actually got shot down. Um, when you know when uh, World War II vets that landed at D-Day, uh, in talking with them, they would say, "Hey, I don't even rem I remember being on the ship, and then I remember six days later, everything else complete blur. I don't remember anything that happened." I could believe that these days, because I know that that helicopter got shot down. I was a radio guy. I was talking with the helicopters. I had a, a headset that was plastered to my ear. Um, I know I heard that they were going down. I don't remember it at all. But I do remember that it was almost a communal decision very quickly. Now we need to change the mission and go secure that helicopter. So um, once we that decision was made. It was a foot race from the initial um, uh, building over to the, uh, to the uh, helicopter crash in order to protect the, the pilot and crew from that one. <clears throat> if I could, I, in terms of bringing something from the book, for those who may have read the book, there was like a dialogue between one of the, um, I think it was a specialist or something, E4, and with the platoon leader um, who was saying, we need to keep on the mission, and the, the E-4 says, no, we need to go and secure the crash site. That is the new mission. And, and, and in the book, it talks about how he started running to go to the crash site, and then ultimately that's when they got word uh, to, okay, now go secure the, the uh, crash site, but the special was already on. He had some insight in terms of exactly what was needed at that time. Yes. Uh, there, was, there was a bit of a lag between what the actual orders were <laughs> versus what everybody knew had to happen, but it, it, it wasn't much of a lag if, uh, for, for, I guess, for, for what we're discussing. There wasn't much of a lag. It was, it was a six-block foot race between the US, U.S. forces and Somalis to get to that helicopter. Um, So, as we started to move, I can, what I can show you is 
if you look at, at on the graphic where it says Captain Steele and most of his rangers, okay, that block itself, uh, just to give you an idea of how much fire we were taking and, and how much we were trying to go through, um, my chalk, which included Colonel Lechner and uh, part of our uh, first platoon, we started off with 17 guys. We turned that corner and started going up Marahan Road towards the uh, helicopter crash. And um, we went from 17 down to three that hadn't been shot inside of about five to 10 minutes. Um, that was the intensity of the fire that we were taking for that. Um, so it, it, it got pretty peppy, I guess you could say. Um, I myself didn't actually even get to the crash site. I was uh, taken inside a building and that's where I stayed. Um, Sergeant Major Watson actually uh, at, stopped through uh, a couple of times, collect up ammunition and, and uh, check on the wounded. And, but then he continued directing his soldiers throughout the rest of the night. And, um, and that's where most of the ground element um, stayed. That's, we, we just were there. We were stuck there, okay? Now, in order for us to get out, now we have to talk about the ground convoy and my friend Raleigh Cash. Um, that's just one, that's the first time, if you'd watch that, take a look at that route, uh, that's the first route that convoy took in order to get to us just six blocks away. Um, why would it be so convoluted, you may ask? <laughs> this is the days before GPS. There was a guy sitting next to the driver with a large paper map looking at it. As they're taking that same amount of fire that I mentioned that we were taking on the ground, they were taking in vehicles. Big vehicles, small roads, hard to miss. So they were actually trying to go as quickly as possible to avoid as many of those bullets as possible. Um, and making turns rapidly doesn't really happen. So they were taking fire the entire time. And um, the problem with all of that is these are thin skinned vehicles. Bullets were going through those and still hitting guys inside. Um, they continued to take casualties uh, as they drove through the city trying to get to us uh, until the call had to be made that as, as a fighting force, the convoy is uh, combat ineffective. We have to leave. And the decision was made that they had to return to base. Um, and what I find absolutely amazing is that uh, like I said, uh, myself and the ground forces, we were in the city, we were stuck. We had no choice. The guys on the convoy, they were in the battle and then they had to leave the battle. Then they made the conscious decision, I'm going to go back into the battle. And they took the same kind of casualties that they did the first time and became combat ineffective and had to turn around and go back to base and refit and rearm and then make another decision later on, we're going to go back into this again. That's a level of dedication that I, it's hard to comprehend, right? Um, and, and I should also add in, you know, I mentioned the Malaysians and the Pakistanis and the 10th mountain, you know? They all had to make that conscious decision to go out into the city to join into this fight and God bless them, they did, right? So um, with that, uh, they got to us the final time at 2.30 in the morning and um, then we sat there. And we sat there because the pilots' bodies were still trapped inside the, uh, in, inside the aircraft. And so those ground forces that were still not injured, that were outside of the vehicles, spent the next four hours under fire trying to extract the bodies of the pilot and the co-pilot uh, from that aircraft. Um, us wounded folk actually got put inside the vehicles and we sat inside waiting 
waiting until it all got done. And then by uh, about 6.30 in the morning, um, bodies have been extracted and we decided it was time to go. Uh, once they drove off, we, we drove off, those that hadn't been hurt in a fight the entire night, there was no room because we had too many wounded on the vehicles. They had to run out. Um, and uh, the evacuation point was a Pakistani stadium. Well, it was, it was a Somali soccer stadium, but it was controlled by the Pakistanis. We drove to the stadium and uh, began to unload and uh, you know, kind of take an assessment of, of what had happened. Now, all told, we lost 18 from our task force, 70 to 80 of us were wounded. If you think about that, it's out of about 130 uh, to 140 ground fighters uh, in all of that. Not too many guys got, got out uninjured. Um, but Somalis, uh, you know, they didn't fare quite as well. We had a lot of technology on our side. We had our aircraft. Um, and those pilots that are some of the best in the world. And uh, they can do things with their, with their helicopters that physics say are impossible, but they'll still try it. Um, by about eight o'clock in the morning, all the fighting was done. And, um, and that's really what we wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to give you a quick synopsis. And again, this is just one quick story, an overview. There are hundreds of these uh, of stories, you know, from cooks that decided to grab their rifle and drive out into that convoy. Remember I mentioned making that conscious decision? Cooks who have no infantry, well, they, they have infantry skills, right? But they're not like a standard infantry guy. They jumped on vehicles to go join the fight. Um, these are, these are the kinds of things that, that came out of that night. Um, but what we did want to talk about and what Colonel Johnson uh, asked me about is how has it affected everything since then? What, what changes were made from this battle? How did it um, you know, change the Americans' view you know, on, on a lot of this? So let me turn it back over to Nick. Okay. Um, uh, did you want to ask if they had anything to add to um, what you're saying? Yeah. Those guys, before we go to the questions? All right. How about Sergeant Major Watson? Somebody's having to see it now. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, so while we're doing that, to, to get Sergeant Major Watson and the other guys want to put some things in, let me throw in some other things in terms of looking at it 100,000 um, feet above. So you think about this in, in October 92, oh, 93, um, this is two years since the USSR went away. That dissolved in December um, of 91. We thought there was gonna be a peace dividend, right? You had all the uh, military drawn down and things like that. It was gonna be a peace dividend, all right? Um, which didn't happen. He mentioned in terms of like the light skin vehicles and stuff like this with the Humvees and things. Uh, now, that was an upgrade from what was there before because it, it was just a peacekeeping mission to go and hand out food to starving people, all right? And thank God somebody had the wherewithal to say, okay, we need to get the special operations guys to do this and provide them some resources they're going to actually do to go and get this mission in terms of capturing Adid and his lieutenants and stuff like this. And thank God you guys had some of that stuff out there <laughs> or it would have been really difficult for you guys, all right? All right. So, do we have Sergeant Major Watson? Yeah, I'm here, sir. I'm sorry. Key on you because you, you were a platoon sergeant, platoon sergeant, sergeant. And, and going with the theme of how this is in terms of want to talk about leadership at a small unit level um, and about how that was key, and especially at this battle, I believe that was key in terms of E5, E6, platoon sergeant, and platoon leaders. So if you could, do you have anything to add uh, with what Mike said in terms, in terms um, for that moment with you at the time? So I'll just uh, follow along with what you said, sir, uh, talking about uh, leadership. And uh, what I want to key on is uh, the leadership of the, I, I, I don't like to use the word junior, but uh, uh, the junior NCOs, the sergeants, the specialists, 
because the position that I was in, uh, I didn't have any staff sergeant. So it was me and uh, four sergeants, C5. And I knew that they were more than capable of doing the mission. Uh, but of course, that day, that night, then the next day uh, brought out uh, even more uh, to demonstrate what uh, the young Ranger Regiment non-commissioned officer is capable of. Uh, so I will leave leave it at that, sir. Raleigh, 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 Raleigh. Yes, could you guys hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Yes? Okay, I just wanted to add a couple of fun facts. So we didn't have doors on the Humvees until that morning. And that actually irritated us because the way that we would sit in the vehicles was a lot more effective in our minds by not having doors. So we had to put the doors on. So that was frustrating, but you know, thank goodness because we did have bullet resistant glass that we got to slide down. So that kept my knee from getting blown out, which is nice. And the last thing was, you know, after 8 30, 9 o'clock, when everybody hopped on the helicopters and all the wounded, everybody left. Um, all the vehicles are still what was left at the Pakistani Stadium. So we had the, the joy of driving back through the city uh, to get back to the hangar, you know, one more time. Uh, we did take a different route, thank goodness. Uh, it was a lot smaller of a crew on the vehicles, but uh, the good news is that we only got a couple of couple of gunfights, uh, nothing major, nothing like before. Uh, we made it back without any real injuries on the way home. So that's all I wanted to add. Do we have Colonel Lickner? Was he able to dial in? Okay, we don't have him. All right. Well, let me ask my first question, as if I could, with Sergeant Major Watson. All right. I believe you're the only one of the panelists who actually had combat experience before um, being in Mogadishu, all right, where you were in Just Cause. What lessons did you have from Just Cause that may help you inform you of how to operate doing Gothic Serpent in Mogadishu? Uh, say that again, sir, because I missed the first part. I'm sorry. Or lessons you may have gotten from being in Panama that help you out while you were in um, Somalia. Good question. Uh, so what I will, uh, the, the two things that come to mind, uh, well, I would say three. Uh, the emphasis that uh, the Army in general, but uh, the Ranger Regiment put in to build future leaders, the specialist, the sergeant, the staff sergeant. Uh, again, uh, the demonstration uh, in Panama uh, showed what uh, the Ranger Regiment had been building for decades. Uh, that's one. The second one is uh, to, again, train as you fight. So uh, I did, I, I was able, uh, I was part of the uh, airborne assault. So uh, parachuting in, uh, even though you're surrounded by thousands of people, uh, you're still an individual. You're isolated until you start linking up with folks. But train as you fight uh, is is so important and we talk about it uh but uh it not everybody wants to do that so that's the second one then the third one is just being physically capable uh the the army started changing uh its terms from physical fitness to uh physically capable uh and, and i've been out of the army for a while so I, I can't remember all the exact terms but uh being physically capable uh, shown itself in Panama and continued in, into Mogadishu and then where the, the current Ranger Regiment is. So uh, I would, I'll would i leave it at that, sir. Mike, if you could, based on your experiences in Mogadishu, in what ways did the, um, you think the regiment may have changed or the U.S. Army Special Operations or the U.S. Special Operations Command may have changed some things? I know we had a discussion with that before. Sure. Um, I'll answer part of it, but then I'll defer over to uh, some of the other panelists as well. Um, I know after our engagement, there was uh, a lot of discussion uh, about what would we change and how would we uh, do things differently. Uh, some of the 
instantaneous feedback was everybody needs body armor. Um, we all see it. It's commonplace now for every soldier to have a, you know, definitely a front plate, probably a back plate as well. Uh, and I think most, uh, most assault forces have both plates, front and back, um, and that's standard wear. In our era, that was, that was a new thing. And the, if you look at, you know, in the movie, uh, you'll see two different kinds of armor that were used. That was because the air assault group was using experimental uh, designs. And there weren't enough of them to go all the way around, so they split it up to where there were, there were two different types of body armor that were being used. Um, that, was a, that was a big deal. Um, but the other thing that really changed was medical treatment. Um, you know, these days, everybody carries their own tourniquet. And it was figured out that everybody needs to have that level of um, capability in order to stem the flow of blood and, you know, treat the wounded. Um, we also found out from some of our KIAs that maybe the way they were treat the, the treatment that they got in retrospective might not have been op the optimal way that at the time it was the optimal treatment, but that changed because they found a better way to treat those. I'm not saying that anyone would have survived any, you know, any more, but they definitely uh, changed the way casualties were treated. Um, Raleigh, I think you've, uh, don't you have some other things as well? I just want to say, dovetail on that, the, uh, the medical treatment is definitely the biggest uh, that we've gone. And, and to see it uh, now working with the Rangers again, seeing where they've come from where we were at until now is amazing. Um, another part of that would be uh, the type of fire support training uh, at all levels. You know, there's, there's some knowledge of what they need to do. And more everybody has a pair of night vision um it's standard across the board um and everybody knows how to use a radio and those are two things that we didn't have you know it would have been nice but we didn't have everybody with night vision not, not everybody knew how to use a radio so those would be the three big for me well since i have you still here raleigh um how do your experience in Mogadishu influence you um as as a military leader uh, as you continue your military career? That's a great question. At, at first, um, you know, never wanted to go back and see anything like that again. Uh, and then understanding and realizing that my duty as a leader is to prepare the next generation for the worst case scenario because I happen to live through it. And so trying to get each generation to understand that they're going to see the worst thing ever be prepared for the worst, expect the worst. And when that doesn't happen, uh, you come out a little bit brighter, a little bit shinier. Um, but by, as Sergeant Watson said, you know, train as you fight, fight as you train. That's so important uh, at all levels and cross training. Uh, learning other jobs is important. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, learning how to use radios, doing radios, uh, learning how to do tourniquets. Um, Pushing IVs is not the first thing we need to do with a wounded, uh, you know, combatant. Uh, it's okay to lose a leg uh, instead of having somebody die because you push fluids and you didn't put a tourniquet on. And think, you know, I'm, I'm glad we've learned that lesson. Um, I guess those would be the the big ones for me. In terms of some lessons you got out of it as a leader. <laughs> um, just, uh, I, I would guess, uh, again, focusing on, um, you know, sort of the fundamentals. If you have people that are working for you, always focus on fundamentals um, because it frees, it frees up processing time. You know, if you think about your mind as a computer, uh, it, you know, and, and computers can only do so many things so fast. 
the mind is the same thing. If you can train fundamentals to where those basic processes are things you don't have to think about, that frees up other space for you to be thinking about the next mission or the next uh, action that you're going to take and how you're going to how you're going to finish the mission. Now, Mike, when he came off active duty and, and joined the National Guard, he was we were in the same company, and I, I don't remember if I was a platoon leader for the platoon you were in, um, but I was one of the lieutenants there, and he was definitely one that said, no, sir, that's not how we do that. <laughs> this is how I do it. And usually, you're a lieutenant, you say, I know everything, you know. But no, I said, okay, this guy comes from this history of working at this high level, and you know, at the National Guard at that time, in 93, 94, 95, when that was, you came to us, we were still here as a, a strategic reserve and stuff like this. So I deferred to him, all right? Um, and it was extremely helpful for the organization, our unit, at that time. Um, and it paid dividends for me as a leader in terms of to let you do your thing, <laughs> in terms of help to shape our training, all right? Um, In terms of one thing um, that we talked about at one point is in terms of how this may have been for spouses, what you guys, why you were over there, all right? And if anybody who read the book, um, there's a, a moment in the book where he talks about with Captain Steele in that, that building <laughs> where you said I was out of the action over there because he, he was wounded. And he was one of the guys that were saying, hey, when are we getting out of here? When are we getting out of here? And the book talked about a moment where you said, hey, I got to get to the base to make my phone call to call my girlfriend or I'm in big trouble. <laughs> All right. How, how, how was that in terms of um, that you know, in terms of, you in terms of connecting with your, your future wife or if you get information from her, how that was for her to see this on the news about this? Um, well, I'll say <clears throat> casualty notification has come a long, long way since 1993. Um, you know, all kidding aside, once I was wounded and in a hospital and actually on my way to Germany, um, the, the casualty notification officers at the regiment, they actually called my parents. And the only notification was, your son's been, uh, been injured in combat, he's on his way to Germany, and that was it. <laughs> the only way at, at that time that my parents and my family got any other information was a familial connection because my sister and brother-in-law, who were both on active duty, had connections with the surgeon who saw me at the 10th Cash Hospital in Somalia and they messaged him immediately and said, what's his status? And they actually got a medical report uh, on me. So, but that was completely outside of the, of the standard notifications. Um, these days, it's a whole lot better. And uh, you know, I, I spent a, a few years working for the Special Operations Care Coalition, which is designated as an organization that will take a, a soldier and their family, or, or I should say a critically injured soldier and their family, and work with them from point of injury and through rehabilitation, putting them back on duty and or uh, medically retiring that person, but working with the family uh, mostly. The, the soldier themselves, they've got doctors. You know, they've got doctors, they've got therapists and all that. The Care Coalition is now all involved with what's going on with the spouses. And, and I should say, Raleigh Cash is now heavily involved with that, and he's actually still working with the Care Coalition. Um, did you want to add anything to that? No, you nailed it, bro. is, you know, they are holding the hand of the spouses and, you know, the family members and say they're right there. And it's, it's not an easy thing to do, um, you know, showing up where, you know, a soldier just lost both their legs and maybe their, uh, you know, their whole career path is now 
terminated. And they have to figure out what the new normal is going to be and to talk to them at bedside and say, okay, I'm going to help you and I'm going to be with you every step of the way. And oh, by the way, your, you know, your spouse, your significant other, your, your parents, this is what we're going to do to help you with them, to make, to give them, you know, as you know, the next phase of their life. So that's a great thing. Absolutely amazing. Now, Sergeant Major, I believe um, you are the senior soldier in terms of being a platoon sergeant at the time. I think you were married also. Have you got any, um, if you're willing to share in terms of how it was for you in terms of communicating with your spouse at the time? Commu for me to communicate to, the, to my wife or from a viewpoint what of my you wife? You got from her about how that experience was um, with this operation going on. She was actually, she departed and went, uh, she, she lives in, uh, or used, well, all her family lives in uh, northern uh, Chicago area. So she was in Chicago uh, when we deployed, or right after we deployed. Uh, and all she remembers is seeing it on TV uh, and then uh, getting a hold of uh, uh, Lee Steele, which was, uh, of course, Mike Steele's spouse, the company commander. Uh, and then starting to get information with her or from her and dealing, uh, trying to deal with uh, the wives, uh, the few wives that our platoon actually had from a distance. Uh, but uh, Karen always talked about that uh, the Ranger Regiment or being in the Ranger Regiment, the, the spouses, uh, at least in B Company and in the platoon, uh, were actually very close. They, they knew each other. Uh, it was genuine, uh, genuine concern, care, uh, and uh, the conveyance of uh, information uh, was, it was already established, uh, but of course, being overseas, it is very difficult to get good, credible information and then trying to keep certain things from the spouse. Uh, but now my wife uh, always said that it, uh, it was enjoyable to be part of uh, the spouse network, if I could say that. Okay. All right, great. I'm going to have one more question uh, to ask the group, and then we can go into you guys' questions in the audience online. My last one is going to be, and this is going to be pointed because um, we have several ROTC, senior ROTC, college level ROTC units um, who may be watching, um, and I'm going to ask each one of you guys what sage advice would you pass on to that new? or young E5, E6, E7, or that platoon leader? Okay, uh, so, so I don't have to uh, say what he said uh, <laughs> later on. I'm gonna start and, and I'll say to that new platoon leader, listen to your NCOs. Yes, you are the, you are the decision maker. But please listen to them. That's their entire job is to train soldiers and to make sure that your soldiers are ready to do what you're asking them to do. Trust your NCOs. Okay. Raleigh? 100%. Um, a new platoon leader, get in your platoon charge pocket and listen to everything he had to say. Uh, one saying that uh, NCOs have, especially when you get to be a senior NCO, is old horse, new jockey. Um, you get a lot of new lieutenants coming in, lots of good ideas. Some of them are really great ideas. Um, they just tend to not know how to implement them quite correctly. Um, most platoon sergeants are open to new ideas if done the right way. Um, so listen to that platoon sergeant especially and listen to your team leaders. They have the ground truth of what your boys are thinking. Outstanding. Outstanding. All right, um, Sergeant Major, since you had um, not only been in a regiment and you ultimately rose to be a brigade Sergeant Major, tell us what sage advice would you give to that young lieutenant um, who knows everything but don't know much? <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, I'll go with Enforce the standard. Don't deviate. Uh, yes, uh, you do love the troops, and I do that, mean that sincerely. Uh, 
Uh, you live with them, you grow with them, you, you, you put everything into them. And then uh, if you deploy and have to go into a combat situation, uh, you, you may have to put them or give them an order that will put them in harm's way and possibly get them killed. Uh, but all that goes back to enforce the standard, enforce discipline. Uh, I, I'm an extremist, meaning uh, I was ruthless. Uh, I, uh, After leaving the regiment, I, I believe I actually got harder on people because it was, uh, when I left the regiment, it was about standards. Uh, it was all about the basic skills. Uh, because that's what saved lives. That's what kept people alive and functioning, uh, even if they were wounded. So uh, enforce the standard, uh, be disciplined, and uh, train. Train as realistically as possible. Thank you, sir. Hey, thanks. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. We're going to be moving on to our question and answer part of the presentation. If you are joining us in person tonight at the back of the room, we have our friend Javier. Javier has the microphone for the guests who are in person tonight. We're going to do this old-fashioned style, everybody. If you have a question, you're going to raise your hand like you were in school. Um, there are a lot of guests joining us in person and both virtually tonight, so we're going to get to as many questions as possible. We're sorry if we don't get to everybody's questions. We're going to get to as many as possible. Possible. For those of you who are joining us virtually online via Zoom at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see the Q&A button. You can go ahead and use that Q&A button to send us questions virtually. If you have a question that's for a specific veteran, um, Cash, Watson, Goodale, or Johnson, feel free to let us know who the question is for somebody specific. Otherwise, it is absolutely okay to ask us broad questions, and we'll do our best to answer all of them. All right, Javier, I have a question here in the front row to get us started. I lied, he'll get to you. So yeah, this is going to have to be a, a question for Raleigh. Uh, the, the question was, how many vehicles were uh, disabled in, in the convoy, and were they putting barricades in the roads to stop forward motion? Yes, they uh, burned a lot of tires. That's a smell you'll never forget. Um, I couldn't tell you how many vehicles we put thermite grenades on, but we lost quite a few vehicles couple of five tons. Um, I know we lost uh, at least one Malaysian APC. Um, yeah, it was pretty hectic. Um, but getting to and from point A and point B was absolutely a nightmare because of all the, the different sizes of the roadblocks that they would put in uh, and then light them on fire. So it was basically, we were just a rolling gunfight um, as Mike Goodale likes to say, he could sit there and hear us driving around. It sounded like a, a drum solo from a rock band, just getting louder and louder and louder, and then quieter and quieter as we get farther away because we couldn't turn left at that one intersection. So we had to go around the other way. Um, but yeah, we I'd say the soft skin Humvees will drive on four flats. Um, at least they did back then. Um, Plus, you know, we were a little motivated to get to where we needed to go. So, but as far as total numbers of vehicles, I'm not sure, but the roadblocks were not fun. All right, we have our next question up here in the front. Thank you. Gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for your service. It sounded like it was a bad deal. Okay, so it's a two part question. First, do you know what the munition was that took down the helicopter? And then, do you know what they were hitting you with in the convoy? Well, uh, so the helicopters were taken down by rocket-propelled grenades, RPGs. 
Um, I don't know how many of them they actually had, but there was no shortage of them. Um, and if you shoot enough of those out there, eventually you're going to hit something with the them. The country was awash with weapons and, and ammunition, wasn't it? That's why it my understanding of it was. It, yeah. it absolutely was. Um, what was the second half of the question? Okay. Uh, do you know what the munitions were that they were firing at you during the convoy part? Oh. That would be for Raleigh, but a, a lot of it was... Wasn't I can it Soviet say it was, era? It was Warsaw all, Pact? Yeah, Soviet era, AK-47s, um, whatever they could pick up. Because remember, Somalia was under the Soviet umbrella, um, and so I'm sure they had a, a, a whole lot. We actually had some RPGs that were fired so close to the vehicles that they didn't have time to arm, so they just went into the vehicle. All right. All right. We have our next question from us online. What kind of battle mental health support were you provided given how traumatic it was? Would that be any different today? Um, okay. Uh, mental health. At, at the time, I will just, I will try and be as correct as possible and say, there wasn't a lot. Um, these days, yes, there is. There are quite a bit of uh, resources that are out there um, that that are actually encouraged these days. Um, you know, it used to be there was a fear in the military that if you went for mental health counseling, it, that would be in your record permanently and it would affect your possibility of promotions and or then you know possibly work on medically uh, giving you a medical retirement kind of thing that so there was that stigma that was attached to it back in the 90s and and you know pre 1990s um, these days it, it's much more open and it it came out with a lot of sergeants major and you know other and officers coming out and actually saying i had to go get help because things were in my head that you know weren't supposed to be there or i was having difficulty dealing with um, now there are lots and lots of avenues that you can take to help uh, go along with that and you know i'll defer to raleigh again because again he's He's in, actually in there helping the, uh, the guys out um, as they come back um, to, to work through these things. Okay, so while everybody else was on convalescent leave, uh, you know, Mike and all those guys, um, we got to line up, go into a room one at a time with the, uh, the chaplain and a psychologist. And they basically said, you okay? And we'd say, yeah, we're good. And they'd be like, okay, go back to work. Uh, it's a lot different now. Um, we actually still utilize the chaplain and all the other resources that are available. The stigmatism is, the stigma is still there a little bit with uh, more senior guys being still afraid uh, in the special operations community to actually reach out and get help until they're in the twilight of their career and they're about to retire. Uh, but it's getting better every year. Um, to compare what it's like now to what it was back then is light years ahead of where we were. And seeking mental health treatment now is not a negative comment connotation to the rest of your career. Uh, it's actually, it's refreshing to see. Two cents in on that in terms of about mental health services, what it was and things like that. You got to think about at that time, how our army and I think also the, the Marines were set up like this. You didn't have psychologists and stuff at units at that level. They were at the hospitals, way at, in the back at the hospitals and stuff like this. You may have had, besides your medics um, that was with your unit, and then you had your doctors who may be at your battalion headquarters or your brigade headquarters, which how the, I don't know exactly how the 75th Regiment was um, organized, but I'm sure all those guys, the actual doctors, were probably at the 
at the uh, air, not the airport, what airport where you guys were, and then in land school and things like that. So you didn't have all that structure that we now have at the battalion and brigade level that we have now, or having teams of psychologists and mental health professionals going to different units. For probably most of us here, our only knowledge and exposure to the mission might have come from the book, but more than likely from the movie. Was the movie a fair representation of the mission, or was it Hollywood? Um, so I'll take a, a first stab at this. It gets the point across. Uh, the benefit from my perspective on you know this experience if there hadn't been a book or a movie I would have to be if I wanted to talk about what we had done I would have to break out a map and start explaining all of this you know going way back there is because of the book and because of the movie there's that almost there's that pop culture recognition um, which I guess in the grand scheme of things, it it gives me a little bit of um, what's the word I'm looking for. Th there's at least some sense of understanding from the population. Oh, you were there. Yes. Now the thing is, you know, we've had 20 years of combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, and outside of a very small number of cities and or engagements, how many of us out here would recognize if someone said, hey, I was at Haditha Dam, or, you know, I was in, you know, the second battle of Fallujah. It may not, rec it may not hit with all of us the same way, so it makes my life a little bit easier having you know, a book and a movie, unfortunately for all these other young soldiers that went through their experience, which was, I'm sure, just as traumatic and just as impactful to their lives as this was to mine, they don't necessarily have that recognition when people talk about it. I think it definitely increased people's awareness by having the book and the movie. Without that awareness, as you were just saying, nobody would be aware of it in terms of this. I look at Somalia as an operation that was seeing how our military, especially our army, was in transition. Because based on that operation, I believe you had leaders like General Saseki and others who were saying, hey, we got to come up with some type of vehicle that we're able to operate in in terms of to have a little bit more protection, but a little bit mobile, more mobile than the Humvees. And we can't have tanks because they're going to get bogged down. All right, we need something like that. And then look what happened after this was with um, Bosnia, Ukraine, not Ukraine, I'm sorry, Bosnia, um, um, Yugoslavia, in terms of where they needed something like that. But ultimately, I think that's where we got strikers and some other things. Just like with um, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, the movie by um, Hal Moore and Joe Galloway brought out the I Drain battle. If that book or movie didn't go out, nobody would know about I Drain. But that was one of the first major battle we actually had the Vietnamese um, forces against um, the U.S. forces. A pivotal fight, just like this was. All right. Anyone want to um, add anything? I will, sir. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I was lucky enough to uh, go to Morocco and uh, watch part of the filming. So I'll, I'll address or try to. Uh, be uh, very specific uh, about the gentleman's question uh, about the realism or uh, was the movie Hollywood. It, it was both uh, the realism. There was a lot of realism in the movie, uh, but as because there was several of us uh, that that were over there at different points of time during the movie, the filming in the movie in Morocco uh, that were actually uh, survivors of Mogadishu, as I say. Uh, so, uh, some of them actually worked on the film and, uh, to be as honest and realistic as possible. Uh, so, uh, there was veterans over there that actually had their hands on things 
as far as they could go. Uh, and then when they brought the actual true Blackhawks over from uh, with the 160th and then a, a platoon from B Company 375 that actually did the fast roping, uh, uh, the real there was a lot of realism, but the realism goes only so far within a movie. And then all the drama is started. Uh, to me, they, they put too much drama in between uh, us and them, uh, their officer against our officer and, uh, and problems. Uh, but uh, what I really appreciated was from both the book and the movie was that it, it showed what the, the Ranger Regiment, the individual uh, Ranger, uh, private specialist, young E5, uh, not taking anything from the staff sergeants or above, but what they were truly capable of. Uh, sometimes I, uh, they, they showed them in a bad light, but that's, uh, I'm, I'm very jaded about things. Uh, but uh, that's what I was appreciative of, is that uh, they showed the, the young ranger and what they were capable of. They, we weren't simple-minded. You go there and just sit over there until either I call you or you get shot. Uh, they acted and did things that uh, amazed me through the day, through the night, and then the next day. So thank you, sir. All right, we have a great many educators who are joining us this evening. Um, and this comes to one of our professors who's jo who is joining us from the U.S. Army War College. They'd like to know, Black Hawk Down illustrates the different cultures of Rangers and Delta Force. How would you describe the respective cultures during the operations in Somalia? Um, so, so yeah, that, that's a broad question. What you have to understand is that, yes, there, there are two separate cultures between Delta and the Ranger Regiment. And the Ranger Regiment is made up of, a, you know, at least at the time, uh, a lot younger and uh, unseasoned soldiers. Delta Force, they're, they're typically older. They've been around the block once or twice. Um, and from my perspective as, you know, a young NCO, we saw that as an opportunity to learn from the guys, you know, from the squadron. And so any time we had a chance to work with them, we, we jumped at it. And there, you know, there were times when they said, hey, okay, we're gonna teach some, you know, some demolitions. You guys wanna learn? Well, hell yeah, we wanna learn. <laughs> teach us, teach us how to, you know, breach a door properly. Teach us how to cut, a, you know, a perfect circle in through a wall. Things like, these are things that they already know and we wanted them to share that knowledge. And, and we really got into it and we enjoyed it. Now, I, as far as I could tell, it was always a good relationship uh, from my you know, from my vantage point, um, others may have had, you know, different, uh, different thoughts on that. And, and, you know, as was the, the drama was, you know, brought out in the movie, like uh, Sergeant Major Watson said, it, maybe that was there. I didn't see any of that, but that was me. Uh, what about you guys? Yeah, that, that was a very good question, uh, Professor. Uh, so I guess the Ranger B Company and being put together with C Squadron was one of the rare times that the Ranger Regiment and uh, Delta actually truly intermix. They intermix all the time now, all a soft does and has for the last 20 years. So, uh, I agree with Mike that the relationship between the platoons and 
the teams were actually pretty good. A lot of the uh, the C Squadron uh, NCOs were uh, very easy going. Uh, they they talked to our folks uh, or the talked to the young rangers. The young rangers were uh, definitely attracted to uh, that environment for sure. Uh, and from my standpoint, and even uh, 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 my one of my best friends, Larry Perino, and uh, which was we were PO and platoon sergeant together, that uh, we did have to pull the platoon together or at least talk to the NCOs to talk to their the young rangers to say, okay, here. Uh, some of you are migrating their way. You're starting to look like them. Uh, uh, so don't, we, we had to, we had to pull them back into, uh, our world to a point. Uh, but there was a lot of, uh, good knowledge being passed back and forth, especially with weapon systems and, and how they use sites and, uh, the type of sites and the things that go on weapons and then medical training and, uh, then how they enter rooms and clear hallways and all these things. Uh, and they were uh, superb at it. Uh, but there was a handful of them, the senior, not all the senior NCOs, but there were a few that uh, uh, they they just, uh, they looked down upon the young ranger, uh, thinking that, well, yeah, you're not at our level. Well, of course we're not, but our jobs are different. Uh, plus you don't have, 75, 80 percent of C Squadron as privates and spec force, uh, which actually did a superb job uh, uh, during the battle. Uh, but uh, like Mike said, those those TIFs and those few that had uh, ego problems uh, were few and far between. Most of the, the NCOs from C Squadron were uh, easy to speak to, easy to mingle with. If you had a question for them, uh, they would answer and vice versa if they needed something from us. Uh, they, and they they would come and see us or they would speak to us out on the street. Uh, but they it was also a they got used to us and the way we operated. Uh, and many of them were uh, from the Ranger Regiment, but they had been out for a while. Uh, so uh, there, there was a learning curve on both sides, uh, but it, it it was a good environment. All right, we have time for one last question. This is just a follow-up to the previous question about the uh, Black Hawk getting hit. I read in the book that the helicopter pilots were surprised that they would use RPGs against the helicopters because the RPGs were primarily used on the ground straight out and not in the air. And uh, Is that true? And, and if that... Would have been known. Would the air, air, would the Blackhawks flew, flown higher to avoid the RPGs? Ooh. Um, well, right. I mean, an RPG is typically an anti-armor weapon. Yeah. It's used to blow up, blow a hole in a tank. Yeah. Um, but you know, the Somalis had it available, so yeah. why not use it? Um, and if you've got a whole bunch of them, why not shoot a whole bunch towards an aircraft? It, it makes sense to me. Um, I don't know if the pilots were necessarily surprised by it. Um, that was how the book was. But I mean, may, maybe, maybe just the sheer volume of how many there were. Um, but I have to say, you know, all those pilots reacted uh, with every bit of knowledge that they had, and they, they did a great job. I mean, just the fact that some of these aircraft were actually taking RPG hits, yeah. and the aircraft was able to make it back to the airfield uh, is absolutely amazing, you know, defies physics. I'm gonna mention, if you have the book on page 110, <laughs> what I have here, right. make sure it's 110, oh, I don't know. Well, it, it talks about in terms of how those guys actually had some soldiers from Sudan who actually went to Afghanistan and fought against the Russians when they were there. And that is where they learned to use the RPGs to take down the Russian um, helicopters. So they used that, that experience in Somalia. They trained them and was ready.
Yeah, and if I may add, uh, I, the the 10th Mountain Wolf, they they, they had uh, helicopters over there, uh, and I do believe that they were they were engaged on a handful of times, and one of them was actually shot down. Uh, so for the task force pilots, uh, they uh, they they understood uh, the environment and what the RPG could do or wouldn't do, or uh, and that it would be used against them. Uh, I agree with Mike when he said the sheer volume of RPGs shot at aircraft uh, at different periods uh, or on different missions. Uh, probably took uh, them and even the the headquarters, the general and all them, surprised them a little bit. But uh, I think that went away very quickly uh, because one of the other missions that we were on, uh, they were they were shooting at the aircraft uh, quite a bit, uh, but we were uh, we were much higher uh, at the time because they didn't they didn't drop the uh, the Ranger chalks. Uh, so, but I also believe that. Uh, the two aircraft that were actually ultimately shot down uh, to provide the sniper platform uh, that they were using, uh, they couldn't go much higher uh, without putting the sniper at a disadvantage. So uh, they had to adjust speed, elevation, shifting left and right and doing what it, whatever a pilot does or can do uh, up until... Uh, uh, they're either driven off or they're hit or whatever the case may be. So thank you, sir. All right. I want to thank everybody so much for joining us this evening. A couple of quick announcements before we leave. Please do not forget to mark your calendars. Thursday, September 14th, we have a How Ike Led with Susan Eisenhower. Registration is required to confirm your seat in person and virtually. Um, and also another special thank you to our very good friends at Cantini Post 556. American Legion is in the back of the room today with the mailbox. They are accepting donations this evening for the Midwest Shelter for Homeless Veterans. Um, I want to thank you guys again. And just one final round of applause for Mike Goodale, Nick Johnson, Sean Watson, and Riley Cash for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for their service. And a special thank you to your service for all of our veterans who are joining us this evening. And thank you again for visiting us here at Cantini Park and the First Division Museum.